Welcome everyone to yet another fascinating uh, conversation that we have lined up for you today at um, Sonali's Kibo. I am uh, the founder of Vijayanti Pogalia and uh, I welcome you today to this very, very interesting conversation that I have lined up with you uh, with a nutritionist, uh, a wellness coach who's joining us all the way from Mumbai, Shilpa Amin. And I would be speaking more in detail uh, about Shilpa to you. And uh, yes, but yes, let, her, let us just get her into uh, the conversation today and, um, you know, uh, uh, then we can carry on about the amazing lineup of conversation we have for you. Hi, Shilpa. Hi, Vaishanti. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. And thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I love the work that you're doing. And I'll be formally introducing you to my guests, telling them more about your work. But yes, to begin the today's lineup, uh, viewers, I wanted to share that, um, and maybe Shilpa, you would agree that, uh, you know, that a recent study that was just taken, uh, it was said that the fat consumption of modern people has increased from 6% to 9%. And this is mainly the take that we're getting it from the West. You know, the West has introduced this, this um, low nutritional food value to us, which we Indians have incorporated. And now they have realized it before us and how they have made these changes with, you know, uh, the balanced carbohydrates and the go greens and uh, the light protein diet. Maybe I'm wrong, Shilpa, but how much ever research I could do about the subject. Um, you know, they are so self-dependent with their house chores and they are busy physically, you know, catering to all of that, which adds to the balance in their body. Whereas we Indians are just gym prone, you know, there are a lot of other exercises and, uh, you know, routines which are coming up. But if you look at the wider sphere, it is the gymnasium and definitely we have that real fat uh, to look into, which uh, the consumption rate is high. Or maybe we are not too aware with the combination nations that the way we are using the food and that's exactly where the nutritionists come in vogue where uh, they they alarm us with the right combinations uh, you know the right choices that we need to make to live a healthy and uh, I think a strong day because most of us start feeling so weak uh, after we start following someone and after two days of that high energy level you know we feel that the energy is depleting somewhere so I quite like the way, uh, you know, Shilpa has put up that for her, uh, you know, the wellness coach that she is, the nutritionist that she is, she says she doesn't call it diet. She calls it uh, a lifestyle change. And uh, that is something which is amazing uh, about Shilpa that she believes on that one-on-one -on -one and maybe something just worked for someone might not work for the other person. So it's no, uh, you know, a sense in, uh, uh, you know, just repeating oh you know you watch shed so much weight with that particular person so you know Shilpa I want exactly the same diet so maybe that doesn't work for you so yes there are actually a huge there is actually a huge science behind it and um, you know uh, I think then another very alarming thing is which is an international study says that uh, an average Indian starts getting obese from about 35 to 45 years of age. So the earlier the awareness comes in. And I'm sure, Shilpa, you would agree that the awareness is very high these days. You know, people yeah. and children, the teenagers are very conscious. But maybe the consciousness is not, uh, it, it's not 100%. It's like they hear something somewhere and they follow something somewhere. And as you say that, uh, they don't know how far it's going to be working for them individually. So that's where uh, friends uh, Shilpa comes in because uh, she is going to break myths uh, about many conceptions that we have in our mind. If you have any questions asking, um, Shilpa about any particular thing you can leave it in the comment box and we would try and answer to those questions uh, once we are done with uh, the main topic today which happens to be gluten uh, uh, you know yes and yes uh, friends Shilpa is here who uh, you know 
makes a graph of diet for you, which works, uh, you know, against the craving that you have and not against you. It works with you so that you can deliver the best. Uh, she doesn't believe in that typical cookie cutter diet, as she calls it, which is, uh, you know, I like the way she says, a cookie cutter diet, which uh, is, uh, you know, not applicable to everyone. It is very individualistic, very personal. And uh, that's where Shilpa comes in. So yes, Shilpa, uh, I am super excited to get into this conversation all about gluten, you know, because I remember the days when I used to teach a food, cooking food, uh, you know, culinary art. The first thing that people used to tell me is, please do some recipes without gluten. Good. And I was like, okay fine without gluten now this is another like uh funda which is there so yes um before we start our uh you know knowledge share about gluten i would like you to tell the viewers something about yourself about how you got into being a wellness coach what is it that you like being a nutritionist something beyond the subject which is totally sure. about you yeah over to you Shilpa. Thank you so much for the beautiful reception, the welcome uh, and talking something about me and something I believe in. Thank you so much for having me here today, Vaishanti. Uh, I believe that food is the essence of life. Food is everything where, that we do. We work hard, we earn money so that we can buy food and we can nourish ourselves we can nourish our family uh, mother every day wakes up early in the morning she goes into the kitchen the first thing she does is cook for the entire family so food is the essence of life itself you know and every culture over the years have made their own um, you know kind of uh, systems of how they work around food and food that is available locally so like you rightfully said something that would work in the US or America or Canada is not going to work here because that is not what our culture is True. right those are not the ingredients that are available locally for us you know so if I tell a US based citizen or uh, a Caucasian to have a bajre ka rotla or a bhakri or a roti, he is not going to understand what the hell I'm talking about. And vice versa, if you go on a, a macaroni, cheese, a beef, a chicken grill diet throughout, that is not a part of our culture either. It will not so, be satisfying mentally also. I would absolutely buy sabzi, dal, chawal, maybe maksa. Exactly. Well. Exactly. So that is where I come from is I love food. I love, if you see, my background also is in the kitchen. So I, that is the essence of who I am. I love food. I love cooking. And I think food is the actual uh, energy that boosts you to live a better life. It uh, also, um, food also creates positive and negative vibes in your life. And therefore, food is something that has always been close to my heart. Now, being that also helps me to connect to individuals in a very positive manner in the sense that why did I say I do not give out a standard diet to everyone because they come from different backgrounds and cultures and therefore you have to work around that as to how where were they born how were they brought up what did they eat when they were little children and their digestion works accordingly because that is how their dna works that is what food they have grown up with so i cannot just pull out everything from the table and say now this is what you're going to eat all the time it's not fair for them and they will not follow it you know they will follow it for some time lose some weight and after some time say now i'm back to normal and i've put it on what does normal mean change your normal change your everyday lifestyle and make a new normal for yourself mm. so that you do not put on that excess weight. And like you rightfully said, uh, the, the percentage of fat is gone up in our diet, but the fat which we do consume is the processed food fat, you know, which is uh, in the cookies and the cakes and the pastries, etc. But uh, like I said, our Indian tradition has beautiful fats in the kitchen. They have their ghee. You have your, you know, cold press oils, which are beneficial for the body. Yeah, so, so I if have a few questions lined up, you know, in this process, which I want to ask you, uh, Shilpa. Absolutely. The process or our Indian fats or about water, specifically about water. There is so much of myth about a simple 
thing like water also. But yes, before I ask you that, I want to ask you, what is gluten and where all can I find this? <laughs> so gluten is the protein found in certain cereal grains, particularly in wheat, barley and rye. Okay, so wheat, for example, has two kinds of protein, glidin and glutenin. So glutenin is the gluten part that gives it that soft, gooey texture that we all love when we break bread, that we make pastries out of. That is what gives it the softness, right? right. That is what gluten is. That is in these cereals. Now, if you ask me, what is it present in? It is present in everything from right from the chapati that we eat to the breads that are available to the pastries, puffs to sauces, to preservatives, because they act as good stabilizers in packaged foods, to cosmetics, lipsticks, powders, to fried chips that you have in a packet. Everything has gluten in it today. Even cold meats that is available, you know, these frozen meats that are available, ready to bake, ready to cook, ready to fry. They have gluten in them. They have breadcrumbs in there. So gluten is in everything and everywhere that you look around you. So gluten is something that we've been having for ages together. You can't avoid it, Shilpa, because it's everywhere. Yeah, so you, uh, gluten is something that we've always eaten and you do not have to avoid it. But then there are a certain percentage of people worldwide that need to steer clear of gluten. And there are also reasons why, you know, um, if you have certain, uh, certain symptoms that are coming up, uh, which you cannot pinpoint, or which a laboratory cannot tell you what the reason is, then there are certain inflammatory foods that we remove from your diet, and gluten is one of them, because gluten does cause inflammation. What you just said, uh, gluten is something that maybe certain people need to avoid. So like this gluten, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a disorder that people have. Yeah. So my question to you is, what is a gluten disorder? And how does one know that, okay, I might be having this problem because I am... I, I'm allergic to gluten. So people see the, the diseases that come with gluten, the one which can be detected in a laboratory, one is a celiac disease. It's an autoimmune disease. So the moment a person with a celiac condition absorbs or takes gluten in, the body gives a strong immune response and it starts destroying the inside of the small intestine. What happens because of that is you're constantly having bloating, cramps, and you cannot absorb the nutrients that you're eating. So you basically become anemic, you become vitamin deficient, you start losing weight. And so that can be detected in a laboratory through a blood test. Even if you have a wheat allergy, it can be detected in the laboratory. Right. But there is a huge chunk of population out there that do not, they come negative in this category. Okay. So... So they would be negative for celiac disease. They would be negative for a wheat allergy. Um, there is another kind that is called the irritable bowel syndrome where you're bloated all the time, where you're constipated or you have diarrhea all the time. You are negative for that as well in a laboratory. Right. So there is a new term called non-celiac uh, gluten sensitivity. It's NCGS. Okay. And it's a medical term which is now accepted worldwide. So when people have NCGS, uh, that is the time when they come negative on paper when they do these tests. But then they have other symptoms like joint inflammation, they would have acne, they would have hair fall, they would have itching skin, they would have depression, you know, they would have brain fog. They were, they, there are so many other symptoms that I can pinpoint on. And when a person comes with those symptoms and when they stop eating gluten, usually those symptoms start going away. So uh, over here, I want to ask you, Shilpa, like I'm sure you have many cases coming to you, uh, you know, uh, 
where they also don't know that they are allergic to gluten only when they tell you the symptoms is when you probably ask them to take this test out so uh, on a normal day like on a normal uh, everyday living when does one know that okay i might be having a gluten uh, issue when i should get a test done for it or maybe i should tell my doctor who is overlooking the fact totally that i might be uh, you know yeah. not a yeah. gluten friendly person so because to diagnose it at a time when it can help uh, the person is very important so if you could guide something about that to us so first when you think you are getting continuous joint pain you are having a lot of distress the moment you eat your meals uh you are eating all the necessary vitamins that are required and still if you have consistent hair fall you feel weakness you are fatigued and tired at all times you don't get proper sleep etc that is a time you need to go to a doctor and you have to ask if you know you have to look beyond or just medication you have to look at the nutritional aspect yeah. and get an allergy test done yeah. but if that allergy test is negative as well usually doctors stop there because doctors are conventional they are not going to go and dig deeper into whether there is any inflammatory food that is out there okay for them it is roti sabzi kha rahe ho everything is okay nothing is going to affect you so that is when you need to go to a specialist who is able to detect that you know that if there is something that is affecting uh, your insides because of the food that you're eating so then that is that is a case when a well certified nutritionist can help you out and nutritionist who believes in the fact that food can cause inflammation of course yes, yes i know i know uh, but yes coming uh, to the very statement here uh, which you also mentioned uh, that i should be highlighting is that we come from a land where we have cereals and yes. uh, immense numbers and numerous kinds of cereals you know wherein uh, our forefathers have been uh, indulging in and they have not uh, we've not i think in the past heard something like what is gluten and uh, i'm sure they would not even know uh, what is gluten or, and a deficiency with that or uh, an allergy why yeah. is it so common now in, in the modern race uh you know we have been eating wheat for the last 10000 years or so right but in the mid 20th century somewhere there was major um change in the quality of that wheat so the term i would use is hybridization where they changed the way the wheat is grown they wanted to make it more uh they wanted wheat to grow faster and they wanted the uh, yield to be better they wanted the pesticides to work better they did not want the hybrid ones as you just saying they yes 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 and that is what happened that is when that is when they also started increasing the protein gluten in the entire structure of the wheat which was not that to that level and in those days you know so there are some people who also believe in the wheat you know the wheat tree the the plant of the wheat was not that tall before as much as it is now mm. so that entire structure of that crop has changed dramatically and it is strange because of so much of dna change that is brought about that's why we call it a gmo genetically modified uh you know object yeah. so what you're going to do is you are not eating the grain that our forefathers ate we are eating a completely different grain altogether that is much softer ki your roti has to become softer your paratha has to become softer because the gluten content has gone higher which was not that high in the most of the ads that we see on the television is also you know that they, they, they they're showing you that the 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 roti is being you know cut softer back. yeah soft. you can break it in one you know one time and they are soft like cotton and then a child is eating the roti and breaking bread etc right. so it's a trend but that means the gluten is getting higher and higher in all the food that we eat mm -hmm. so yeah so that is the reason why gluten sensitivity has become such a issue in today's uh, entire food uh, pyramid that we have right which was not the case before so will you advise uh, uh, so whom would you advise i am i'm like obviously the ones who come to you with these symptoms uh, as you just mentioned fatigue and hair fall and 
cramps and bowel issues and uh, low on vitamins, losing weight. Definitely, these are the concerns of a person who is uh, uh, probably gluten sensitive. Yes, exactly. But otherwise, there's so many people who are going on a weight loss program, going gluten free. What would you like to say about that? So, uh, anyone who wants to go off gluten is absolutely fine because we have so much food other than gluten available. We have in our Indian uh, culture, we have so many other grains available. We have a bajri, we have a jwari, we have a uh, rajgira, we have the nachni, you know, we have oh, everything available. Right. So substitutes are there. However, if you say I'm going gluten free just to lose weight, you have to keep in mind that are you substituting with more vegetables and fruits? then it is going to help you benefit you in a positive manner. If you are going to go on a shelf of a shop and say, give me gluten-free objects, you're again eating something from a packet. So going gluten-free, trying to lose weight and then eating gluten-free products are not going to help. In fact, it is even more harmful for you because to uh, substitute for the chewiness of the gluten, you add that much more sugar in it, you add that much more preservative in it, right? Because the gluten has a sweetish taste to it and you want to substitute it with another flour. So you put more baking soda in there, you put more sugar in there. So when someone comes to you and says, I want to go gluten free, when they come to me and say, I want to go gluten free, I sit down with them and tell them, tell me what are you going to cook at home? Tell me what are you going to substitute it with? So if you are having a wheat khakra for tea, then how are we going to substitute, or a toast, see, which is more universal. How are you going to substitute it with? What are you going to have at that time? Are you going to substitute like if you it? Ask me today that Vijayanti, if you remove gluten from your one day, I would be removing breads and I would be removing chapatis and I would be removing, as you said, the preservatives and everything. Chalo, even if I don't go to that level of removing preservatives, just to more universal products like breads and chapatis, I would seriously not know what to, re to replace it with. So, so you replace it with rice, you replace it with other grains that we have. So you make beautiful, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you can make beautiful chapatis out of jawar roti, which is called sorghum in English. And then you have your beautiful millets that make beautiful uh, rotis, bread, you know, uh, and then the universal rice rice and dal and ghee that is my favorite which also gives you complete protein it gives you the right carbohydrates it gives you fat all of it put together so simple food real food is what will help yeah but then uh, as our taste buds are so uh, multi cuisined these days you know so we can't just stick to dal chawal and ghee on it so if i have to ask you first before going to the more explicit of diet one person who goes on a gluten free diet what would you tell that person about the energy levels uh, about uh, any other nutrition uh, deficiency that might uh, encourage so would you uh, would it be like if you uh, replace gluten with other uh, cereals and other uh, products um, uh, does it maintain the energy and the nutrients in fact, your energy gets even better because gluten, while, while your stomach is digesting gluten, it takes up a lot of energy. So when you're eating much more simpler fruits, when you're eating more fruits, more vegetables, more salads, more sabzi, you know, you're including more nuts in there, your energy levels are bound to shoot up. Yeah, if you again go into the gluten-free bread mode and again go into packaged foods, that is when there are chances that you might put on weight. So you have to be very careful about the food choices that you make. And that is where, you know, you, you have to be more mindful about what you put in your mouth because you are going into a cleansing diet. Yes, I think that's um, like a detox diet with gluten. So yes, uh, that's very interesting. So friends, we are discussing uh, uh, going on a gluten-free diet or not, or what is gluten. Uh, to tell you more about this magical gluten, we are in conversation with Shilpa Amin, and she's joined us all the way from Mumbai. In case you have any questions for the viewers who've joined us in between a conversation, you can leave that question on the comment box on Facebook, and we would try and answer to that. And one such question, which is very interesting, which a viewer is asking, uh, Shilpa, is that, in fact, uh, 
she said that uh, I feel very good in my gut, you know, yes. uh, whenever I go on a gluten free diet. So is it something which I, is it just psychological or is it actually very bodily? So our gut is this beautiful place that has live bacteria in there. So when you have consumption of gluten, the gut bacteria actually, the good bacteria do not get food that they need. Okay, so this gluten goes and it actually destroys a lot of the good bacteria there. But the moment you go off gluten, you know, not only does your bloating go away, the vegetables and the fruits help in feeding that good bacteria out there. So that automatically helps you to feel great in the gut. So your stomach gets flatter. There is no bloating. Plus, gluten has this capacity of absorbing a lot of water when it's digesting. So what happens is your stomach is suddenly out. The moment you go off gluten, you'll notice your stomach has gone into by two to three inches in just a few days because the water has gone. There is nothing that is pulling the water towards the intestines. So it is as simple as that. So I have these very uh, uh, interesting questions which are coming in my mind. You know, when we women, we touch this 45 or so and we have this pre-menopausal uh, symptoms with us, you know, which is uh, uh, one of such symptoms is also we always feel very bloated. Yes. Uh, you know, even if you've not touched menopause, uh, we are maybe four or five years to go but still we we, we are not we don't feel uh, you know absolute we feel this water retention on our face you know sometimes so would you suggest uh, uh, to whom would you suggest a gluten-free diet number one and would you suggest one for the pre-menopausal women as well so Vajinti, usually when bloating happens, one of the reasons for bloating here is also the hormonal changes that are happening in the body. Yeah. That is definitely there and that cannot be, uh, you know, you cannot shut your eyes for that. Mm -hmm. However, on your part as an individual, you're going through menopause. If you correct your diet, if you take gluten out, it can help a lot in the bloating and the other symptoms that follow like hot flushes, yeah. like pain in the joints, you ask know. Me, ask me, I'm in a bad shape, Shilpa, because of that. But yeah. yes, I, I, I had this question in my mind, which you're answering, you know. So yes, so tell me about this more. I, I'm really in interested. So as you said that... So so at the same time, when you substitute with good fats, now suppose when you are going through menopause, a simple thing is that your estrogen starts dropping slowly. Okay. And that is when your body is going for a toss, you get the hot flushes, etc. And you know, it's, it's like the, the magic is leaving the building slowly. Yeah. And you start feeling horrible. But at that time, if you substitute with these beautiful flax seeds and, you know, which are rich in omega-3s, then you also substitute with the, uh, you know, chia seeds. You substitute with all the lovely seeds. You substitute with nuts for vegetarians. Uh, Non-vegetarians start having more eggs, start having more different proteins in their diet, start having more greens. So, you know, overall, the gut is taken care of. So when the gut is taken care of, your mental state is also good because the gut and the brain has a very strong connection because of the vagus nerve. So when that happens, when all that machine works beautifully up and down, you are strong enough to, to take care of the fact that estrogen is leaving the building. That is all. So you're making your system stronger. Your energy levels go up. You do not feel that fatigued. You don't feel tired all the time. So it's an overall... So when I say... Uh, when people ask me why a wellness coach is I like going a little deeper into the person's background. What are your stress related problems? Okay, so if you are related, if, if you have a lot of stress in your head, your stomach is not going to digest food the way it should. Because again, the brain and the gut is connected. So your, your audience was right of saying that when they go off gluten, the gut is relieved. The gut feels amazing and great and light. Yeah. So that is the thing. You look at the stress factor. You look at the exercise factor. Are they working out or no? Are they doing meditation or no? And the most important thing, Vaishanti, is when you take food in, every morsel that you put in your mouth, remember that every morsel has the Hindi word for it is prana, has life in it. And when you put that in your stomach, when you put that, when you ingest it, and for that matter, when you told me even water has prana in it. 
you put it with a positive thought in mind that this is in there to give me energy to do better things in life and it is going to act accordingly. So sitting and uh, watching the tab or the laptop or the television when you're eating does not make you connect with the food that you're eating. So that the word... So beautiful. And you know what you just said, we can trace its history to our, uh, you know, years on Indian heritage uh, yes. level. Yes. To what our forefathers to forefathers to forefathers used to do. And this is exactly what you're talking is to connect with the food, what we are eating. We should know what we are eating and then increase the receptibility that it's we are taking prana into us. So you mentioned flax seeds and chia seeds. Uh, so if I have to ask you nuts, all right, but which is the correct way of having these seeds uh, in the morning, any time of the day, any particular way of having them? They have it the next day. So if you could like empty stomach, so maybe some myths you can clear about that. So Every time, whatever food you want to eat, whether gluten or non-gluten or salad or seeds or nuts or whatever it is, eat your food when you are hungry. Do not eat because the, your mom says that or your uh, servant has given it to you or your help has kept it on the table or because it's available at that time. Eat only when your body tells you to and whatever time that is, it is fine. As long as it is not too close to your bedtime, it's absolutely fine. So it does not have to be an empty stomach first thing in the morning. But even, even post-lunch, before lunch, mid-morning, breakfast, everything is fine as long as you're hungry. Because only when you're hungry the, are the right enzymes in your intestine produced to digest that food, to assimilate that food and to absorb the nutrients. So you can have nuts when you're hungry. It's fine but only then will it absorb it. You suddenly went on a party and you are at a party and you have a drink in the hand and then you have a few nuts because the waiter is moving the tray around. It is not going to work for you. Mm. But uh, tell me one thing, like with the seeds, a uh, lot of people uh, sort of soak it in the water, some make salads out of it. Uh, does it uh, degrade or enhance the, the you know, the, uh, the quality as in, you know, the nutrient value of these seeds? Or not at all. Not at all. Seeds can be, can be lightly roasted in the oven or on a pan, can be sprinkled with some salt. I love having it with my yogurt. I have it as a dessert towards the end, uh, you know, like a salty yogurt with, because I get the probiotic, I get the omega-3, all of that put together. There are some people who put it in their smoothie and have it, that is fine as well. There are some who sprinkle it on top of the salad. Um, however, flaxseed does lose a little bit of its nutrients the moment you bake it. So, you know, you say flaxseed roti, flaxseed bread, it does lose its nutrients. So it is best to have it raw or lightly roasted for maximum benefit to happen. So it has to go in wherever you're chewing your food well, and then you are assimilating it in your stomach. So if you soak chia seeds in water, that is how it is to be eaten, and it's perfect. In fact, you can make desserts and parfaits out of chia seeds and substitute it with, you know, a layer of sponge cake. A layer of chia seeds can be substituted instead, and it tastes yum. That's amazing. So now, viewers, you should know whom to connect to, and that's Shilpa Amin from Mumbai. She <laughs> is on Instagram and Facebook in case any of you want to connect to her for your high intake of uh, getting the right nutrients and to know about more of her work and follow her and get, uh, you know, uh, the right resources from her. Please reach out to Shilpa. One thing, Shilpa, I want to ask you is in terms of gluten free diet, does it also help uh, people with uh, high blood pressure and diabetes? Because these are the two most common, uh, you know, uh, diseases uh, or conditions, I should say, which is around. It, it does. So overall, uh, losing weight helps in bringing pressure down. Right. Uh, the diabetes that we are talking about is type 2 in particular, yeah. you know, where uh, you are, you, you have put on a lot of weight and then you go for a blood test and you see that your glycated hemoglobin is high, your HbA1c is somewhere uh, above 6 and therefore the doctor starts you with uh, the pills morning, evening, po uh, you know, post lunch, post dinner. Right. Yeah. Uh, the sad part is though that 
these diabetes medicines actually make you even fatter because you want to eat more because you are hungry all the time. You right. don't go to the source of the problem. Right. So yes, diabetes, not proven by the medical community, but going off gluten does help people who are diabetic. And like I again said, not substituting with other packaged food, but yeah. real food overall does help because you start losing weight and your glucose level comes to normal. You know, um, I know of somebody who uh, is uh, on is diabetic, type 2 diabetes, has pressure, but is not overweight, is very fit, uh, very high on his walks and uh, uh, absolutely fit and fine. I'm talking about my husband. Uh, <laughs> not a very handsome looking man at the age of 42, I should say. But yes, uh, he's not at all overweight. He's diabetic. So tell me one thing, the question here arises, those diabetic people who are not overweight, good on energy levels, uh, are maintaining their H1B1, uh, and their, obviously which means they're maintaining their sugar levels. For them, also does gluten-free diet work? Yes, could, could help. So here, Vaijanti, we cannot pinpoint and say it is going to help every individual but what we can do is because gluten causes inflammation in the body something that is proven right what you do is you remove what we do what i do is i remove all the foods that call in, cause the inflammation from the diet right. so three foods in particular are dairy sugar and gluten we take that out from the diet and what is and, what is left and then after going off it for just 10 days, you will see a drastic change in everything. Once you are there, we start introducing one item at a time. So I would introduce a dairy today. So I will slowly start introducing the paneer, the uh, milk, the yogurt again. Okay. If your body is not reacting in a negative manner, if it's not giving you an allergy suddenly, if it's not giving you a cramp, bloating, stomach pain, that means the object is accepted by your body and there is no immune response, then I would slowly introduce something else. Now, when I take out sugar, Vajanti, I'm talking about the synthetic white sugar. I'm not talking about the jaggery, the dates, the exactly. raisins. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You get organic now as well, you know, where farmers are growing, your local farmers grow all these things. Yeah. So I'm not taking away that sugar. I am only talking about everything that is synthetic, that right. is made in a factory, not in a farm. Right. So everything that a farmer is producing is good for you. Please take it. Please use it. So if someone says, I want to make a, um, you know, a, like even my daughter, she loves eating her Indian mitais and sweets. So I said, can we substitute it with something else? There is coconut sugar available. There is jaggery available you know, for sweetening these objects. You can now make a paste out of date and put that in the dessert to make a lovely dessert. So no. you do not particularly need to use sugar, confectioner's sugar. You can use normal sweeteners, which is fine, which a diabetic can have as well. So what I'm taking is everything that is made in a factory and is packaged and has a stabilizer or, uh, you know, something for emulsifying it, something that has got a preservative in it. Right. I pull it out. Simple. And what connection would you call uh, to gluten-free diet and skin? A huge connection, huge. You know, skin is a reflection of what is happening inside. In fact, you're, you know, when you're excited, when you're happy, when you work out, suddenly you become flush red on the cheeks, you know, skin shows your emotions. Likewise, if you have an inflammation in your gut, in your body, and food is not getting digested well, it is going to show on your skin. It's going to pop up in the form of itching, rashes, acne, etc. And uh, external medication does not help here because it will settle the outside. But what about cleansing the inside? So it is what you put in your mouth that is going to affect what's going to happen to your skin. How long would you say a person should be on a gluten-free diet? Uh... If gluten is really eroding the insides of your intestine, okay, I would say lifelong, make it a lifestyle. But then there are people who make exceptions when they go out of town, when they go on a vacation. And because they, like myself, I'm off gluten. But yes, and it looks. 
<laughs> but I love my butter croissant. I will not lie. And I make an exception when I go uh, for a vacation and I have the softest and the best butter croissant available with the black coffee. I make an exception there. So I do keep a few days off. But when you get back to your normal life, you go off gluten again. And this is just to uh, help your insides heal and function in a better manner. It's nothing else. But if you say, if you're off gluten for three to six months, it takes three to six months for your intestine to heal completely and to start absorbing all the nutrients again. Right. And then you can start eating gluten a little here and there. You know, you don't have to be so strict. For example, soy sauce is made with gluten in it. It has, you know, it's fermentation of wheat and soy. That is how the soy sauce is made. Mm. So you don't have to be strict and go for another substitute that is completely gluten-free. Those small things here and there can be added, can be had once in a while. As long as those symptoms do not recur, it is okay. So going back, Shilpa, to something which I really wanted to ask you is this myth about water. Three liters, four liters, six liters. And then someone says that, uh, you know, get your kidney function checked first and then see how much of water you need to take. Because if you're having too much of water, again, it's not good uh, for, your, for your body. Uh, standardized, if you see everywhere, I mean, like you must have three to four liters of water every day. What is your intake, again, on this beautiful form of prana? So when you drink water, I, I, when a client comes to me and tells me, but in your instruction sheet, you've written drink minimum two liters of water because there are people who come to me who barely have a liter of water in a day. But uh, so I write in instructions, I, have, I want minimum two liters over. But another instruction for them is every time you go to pee, you look at the color of your urine. So if it is coming towards a slight you know, if it is pale yellow, you're fine. You're not dehydrated. You're having enough water. If you go and pee and the color of your urine is becoming slightly yellower than the light yellow, you are dehydrated. Come out and have one glass of water. And if you go to pee and your pee color is dark yellow, that means you're severely dehydrated. Just sit with a bottle of water by your side, you know. So that is what, that is like a benchmark that I tell them you follow. That you look at the color of your pee and you decide how it is. Ideal is usually two to three liters. If you're a sports person, if you work out a lot, you're sweating a lot, then of course you have more water as well. You can also have other forms of liquids. It can be in the form of buttermilk. It can be coconut water, etc. Liquids can be had with salt in it. But two liters, the standard worldwide, you know, kind of thing that you have to have. A sedentary person should consume at least two liters of water. So uh, Shilpa, for mid-age women, uh, there's, there's a, and plus I think a lot of people have started to take these supplements, you know, A to Z and uh, uh, Becadexamine and stuff like that. There's multiple yes. Vitamins. yes. What is your take on uh, these supplements along with a good diet? Like even if you're on a dal chawal, uh, roti, fulka diet, you're not gluten-free, but your diet is good. But would you suggest uh, supplements along with your diet? Again, Vajanti, coming back, when we spoke about the crop is changing, yeah. the way the, uh, you know, the land is changing, the fields are changing, the soil is changing. The soil is not as vitamin rich, nutrient rich the way it used to be. And therefore, we do not get the exact nutrients through our diet. So if you feel, you feel weakness, you feel jittery, you feel like you cannot go through your daily routine in spite of having a normal diet on a daily basis, then I recommend them to take those vitamin supplements. Otherwise, you do not require. Your food should provide you with everything that you have. But however, everything said and done, if you still have those symptoms existing where you have hair fall, where the quality of your skin is not, you know, you have dry, patchy skin, you have pigmentation, etc. That those are telltale signs that you are deficient in vitamins. You know, that is when you start having vitamins. And especially when you said middle aged women, we do not, we stop producing, we start absorbing as much calcium as we did before. So 
we still need calcium. Otherwise, we uh, we fear that we will get oyster pearls. You know, you have your bone density becomes less, etc. So you have to have that calcium and magnesium supplement, especially at that age. You know, and especially your menopausal women, you have to take care of your supplements and vitamins. So I would say women by till the age of 30, 35 can be carefree and right. can get everything with a correct nutrition right. from their kitchen at home but once you cross that age limit then you should uh, with the help of a professional start having your supplements so uh, just wrapping up with a few foods uh, shilpa which can substitute gluten i know you mentioned chawal and ragi and millets uh, jawar bajra but what about uh, in breakfast if there's no bread there is no breakfast so what would you suggest uh, to uh, for you know people for a gluten free everyday food so because we stay in india it is very common that people have puffed rice they have poha they have upma so now semolina is also a form of gluten now yeah. they will say how what do you do yeah. yeah so i i replace that with quinoa in my house oh. so instead of semolina i have quinoa that is slightly bigger in texture and then i make an upma out of a uh, quinoa grain or uh, you can use a millet to make an upma you can make a nice porridge out of now oats again is something that people are confused whether it is gluten or non gluten you can make a good porridge out of oats so pure oats are gluten free right however because of the cross contamination because of the unit where it is processed would also have other gluten grains processed and therefore it would have traces of gluten in there so it might affect but if you are not a person with celiac disorder if you do not have a wheat allergy on paper oats is one of the substitute that we also give so you can make a nice porridge out of oats you can make a nice porridge out of natchni uh, you know the grains that is there you can seco it in a little bit of your indian oil your ghee and then you put some milk in there you put your nut seeds you put your uh, you know a little bit of raisins and dates for sweetening you have the perfect breakfast so you have so, to alter the mind so no no obviously uh, the basins have gluten and the dals uh, like the, the no no the also pulses and lentils are absolutely fine to have they do not have any gluten it is only wheat it is only barley rye wheat bran semolina these are the only things that have gluten in it yeah, and it's not too tough to go on a gluten absolutely diet, but absolutely give it a try and see because as you said that uh, they are more hybrid now and not the ones that we were used to uh, absolutely so and you know uh, viewers uh, nutritionists use these ideas which uh, uh, they study this this molecular biology and this biochemistry and the genetics behind food the prana behind food and how they affect the human body and uh, this is what and how the focus of every human being should be that they should be conscious about any changes which they find in their body or in their thoughts in their mind i think when mind is uh, very responsible in telling you as to which are the days or which kind of food is not accepted by the body you know the mind and in fact the body itself flushes it out and you know exactly it's just to be conscious uh, uh, you know about what you're eating and as shilpa very rightly said that uh, each uh, food that we put each molecule is a prana that we are incubating our body with and we should be very receptive and conscious about it and if you ask me shilpa for me a uh, uh, good food and good health is a very holistic health you know where absolutely it, where it is eat lightly and breathe deeply and you know live moderately and uh, cultivate this calmness which you said meditation and maintain a interest in life that is like very important. absolutely Absolutely. Always maintain that interest in life. Before we go, viewers, I would like you to know that Shilpa has joined us all the way from Mumbai. Shilpa Amin, she's a wellness coach and a nutritionist. And if you want to reach out to Shilpa and take her advice on your everyday diet, you can reach out to her on Facebook and uh, Instagram, and she'll be available to cater yes. to need. But, but before we go, some few. you know uh, knowledgeable words from you shilpa before we wind up today's conversation um eat food with mindfulness 
eat food with an approach where you're thankful for every morsel that comes uh, on your plate and in your mouth and in your body uh, with a positive energy. And it is going to digest and give you energy in the same manner. So be happy and positive about everything around you and be thankful for everything, given how difficult times are right now and all the difficulty that the entire world is going through. Um, you should be each and every individual who is healthy, who is at home, who is amongst their loved ones should be thankful for that. That's very wisely said. And um, I'm sure that today's session was very knowledgeable for everyone. We've understood a lot of myths and takes about gluten. And yes, we can read more about them and get firsthand knowledge from it from Shilpa herself for the ones who want to reach out to her. So thank you, Shilpa, for being with me today. Today's series is all about an element creating change. And you indeed have made a difference with your knowledge on gluten. And thank you so very much once again for joining me today. Thank you so much, Vaijanti. It was an absolute pleasure and joy to be here with you today. Thank you, dear. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.